got some question I gotta ask ya. Yeah. Questions up on the floor. Okay, let's go. Let's go and follow. Let's go. What could drive a man to do something this horrific, to go completely off his gourd? Before I tell you, I want to make it clear as crystal that this video would have been impossible to make without its fair share of spoilers. We good? Alright, let's rewind. The farthest back we're able to go with Goro Majima is the spring of 1985. Reportedly hot as hell, and just about to get scalding, as two Tojo jabronis plan to throw their lives away for their clan while they're both barely adults. A hit on Yoshiharu Ueno of the Ueno Sewa, a then Tojo clan rival. Tagoro's side is Taiga's reason for ever turning to a life of crime. Yasuko Saijima, a stepsister whose kidney transplant turned Saijima towards Sasai family patriarch Hideki Sasai to pay. Despite this dedication, Majima is the one to speak up on the girl's behalf. Saijima deflects this with excuses and shifts the conversation to their plan of action. Six revolvers, 36 shots, unbeknownst to them, all rubber. It was a screw job, plotted by the Dojima family's Kazuo Shibata and the Ueno Sasao Katsuragi. Shibata coaxed Sasai with the tips and weaponry needed, while Katsuragi posted himself to look like the hero, as Saijima does little more than knock out every guy in the room before Katsuragi fills all but his boss with real lead. Majima, despite letting his faux Kansai accent slip while proclaiming to have been ready to die for this, was nowhere to be seen. On the day, Shibata intercepted him with lies about the type of fish the whole thing smelled like, talk of Sasai being a Tojo trader and trying to incite war between the two syndicates. Majima doesn't engage with these allegations at all, and insists that he should be right by Saijima's side simply because his sworn brother's already on his way, reiterating that he's been ready to die from the very start. All for the code. Shibata, with a shit-eating grin on his face, allows his prepared goons to send his message in a language Majima can decipher. Majima barks back fluently, but still manages to get tied to a beam before the last man standing caresses his face with a tanto. Majima fails to assert some sort of dominance, stating that he'd rather go blind than bow down to some bitch. Said bitch ceases his tanto's foreplay and jams it straight into Majima's left eye. Following this incident, the Ueno Sewa was left with a fury that wound up being quelled by a truce forged by Shibata and Katsuragi, who had become Yoshiharu's new favorite. A truce that would keep the Tojo and Ueno on equal footing for decades to come. A truce brokered on the back of a scheme that left Sasai in hiding, Saijima on death row, Majima in the hole, and Yasuko left to fend for herself in the city of Chiba. This allowed the opportunity to speak to her disgraced stepbrother for 25 years. Majima was allowed to resurface from the hole by his patriarch, Futoshi Shimano, in early 1987, only to be held captive yet again. This time in Soten Boriosaka. Under the supervision of Tsukasa Sagawa, Shimano's oath brother, Majima's given the task of making and forking over 100 million yen in exchange for a ticket back into the Tojo. He does this by running one of Sagawa's dying businesses, the Cabaret Grand. And by 1988, and at the age of 24, Majima managed to rise this decrepit Garbo club from the ashes, making it the star of Sotenbori's nightlife. To reiterate, he does this with Sagawa breathing down his neck, taunting him, keeping homeless men's eyes on his home, and sabotaging his progress by moving girls to his other properties at a moment's notice. It should come as no shocker that Majima absolutely loathes this bullshit, but no one really gives a fuck about how he feels. As far as Sotenbori is concerned, he's the Grant's charismatic lord of the night, and he plays this character with Broadway levels of grace. As long as he's convinced that his suffering is sure to lead to some sort of future with the Tojo, he'll gulp down every last bottle of Jankum he's handed. If he survived the whole, he can surely deal with this. This dedication is finally put to the test when Sagawa raises the price from 100 to 500 mil, and then again from 500 mil to a human life. 
He toys with Majima here, starts off by feeding him lies about a prostitution ring by a so-called Makoto Makimura, one consisting of snatched up college girls who get beaten when they disobey. But he follows up with a warning about the stench that murder can leave on a man first committing. Majima, in a force of habit, doesn't engage with this at all, thrusting head first into accepting a hit for the sake of his Yakuza code and the future he'll earn by sticking to it. This leads him on a relatively short goose chase. He hits the telephone clubs, finds a girl tied to his mark, and puts those untraceable acting skills to good use. The not prostitute tells him that her boss isn't quite the rat fuck Sagawa sold him as. Doesn't seem to matter though, he's gotta go. Majima storms into the guy's massage parlor, Hogushi Kaiken, and sees nothing, only to stop dead in his tracks in front of a girl who also sees nothing. He manages to calm her down by pretending to be a client, giving himself the perfect opportunity to ask more questions. All the answers he gets amount to, the guy you're here to kill is good actually, before cult classic my ass himself waddles in and immediately knows what's going on. Long story short, the girl's the real target here, and not just Majima's. Very bad. Majima's torn. He's expected to kill this girl, but doesn't want to. At this point in his life, he'd likely kill any man, saint, or scum for his place in the tojo, barking and biting his way from one leash to the next. But with the victim so delicate, he's left to question just how far the value of his code actually goes. Turns out, it doesn't quite reach the sun, and he hides Makoto in a shed owned by Yamagata, his business rival. Majima knows full well that he's doing the right thing here, but as a former man who does wrong things for a living, he can't help but question his self-worth. Calls himself a lost cause, a joke. All because, for the first time in his life, he defied the code that was bestowed upon him the day he shacked up with Shimano. Nevertheless, he's made the bed, now to sleep in it. Majima makes his way back to Kaiken, holds one of Lee's guys at knife point in exchange for info, and finds him at a mahjong parlor gone makeshift hospital where he shit on relentlessly for being green. To Lee, Majima's just a baby fish trying to save his own ass because he couldn't do one job. And despite Majima's performance against his group of goons, Lee's not entirely wrong. Majima doesn't have much of a cohesive motive at this point. He's just going through the motions the same way you could easily assume he always has, through his days with Saijima and his nights shackled to the Grand. It's at this point that Majima gets the scoop, half from Lee, half from Makoto. In 1978, Makoto's brother, now known as Tetsu Tachibana, fled China due to struggles that came with being bi-ethnic there. Eight years later, Makoto followed, and was quickly snatched up and sold to this Sung Young Mafia by a man with a bat tattoo, later revealed as Jun Oda. While owned by this Sung Young, Makoto was subject to levels of physical and sexual abuse so severe that she was left with post-traumatic photogenic blindness before being rescued by Lee. Lee, having been reminded of his now deceased visually impaired daughter, dropped everything on a moment's notice to help Makoto see justice. There were clear parallels here, and Majima sees them. Both he and Makoto were ultimately punished for chasing someone they called brother. Both were subject to unthinkable levels of torture for over a year, and came out with their vision impaired. But while Makoto was freed by a man willing to die for her, and eventually regains her vision, Majima's only allowed limited freedoms by his abuser, and has yet to regrow his left eye. Though, Yakuza 7 shows us that anything's possible. Despite what the differences may imply, Majima insists that Makoto has it worse. Granted, he doesn't have the same hindsight we do. This is when her watch goes off. She liked the chime it once played, but it's broken now, incapable of singing like it once could. Makoto remarks that the things you consider most important can never be thrown away. She views the watch as a memento of a time long lost to her. But the instant Majima agrees, she takes it off, remarking that it's a restriction she has to grow past. Makoto's watch can be viewed as an allegory or symbol for Majima's development, and this will become clearer every time it's acknowledged. Makoto ditching the watch isn't necessarily a visual representation of Majima abandoning his restrictions because, well, he hasn't done that. But what it is, is a hint that he both should and will. It's a subtle inspiration for him. Lee proposes a scheme. Ice a marriage fraudster that resembles Makoto, dress her in Makoto's uniform, and call it a day. Majima's not cool with this, says it won't work, and throws out a really strange virtue signal about choosing who to bring down with him. I think that this is really stupid, but it's also the first time Majima ever displays a fondness for the virtue he grows to embody, autonomy. He doesn't want to feel backed into a corner, taking one life for another. To him, it's my way or the highway, and he expresses this in a very infantile way, by walking out with no plan of action. 
He isn't sure what his way even is at this point. Having one at all is new for him. He doesn't understand it and he's stepping over himself as he tries to. Don't matter though, because the next day he learns that the decoy was killed despite his plea shortly before he gets a call from the killer. Homare Nishitani, patriarch of the Omi Alliance's Kijin clan. He's rented out the Grand and wants to speak to its manager. The guy's having the time of his life surrounded by Majima's girls, titty in one hand and a band in the other, before Majima, stiff as his shaft, tells him to follow the rules of the club. Nishitani wants Makoto. That's the second reason he's here. The main reason, though, is that he really wants a fight with the man who kicked his guy's shit in. And after some pressuring, he gets exactly that. Nishitani is Majima's Majima. He's got the goatee, the tanto, and the aggressive disregard for his own well-being. He throws himself at the cops and wastes just about every last yen he spent on his rental just for the chance to scrap with Majima, leaving him in Sagawa's sights. According to him, Nishitani runs his clan like a public elementary school, and his guys have a real bad habit of messing around on other clans' turf. Majima heads back to give Lee the scoop when that doctor guy Majima threatened earlier rolls up with the Lick Squad that's kept watch on him every night since he took over the Grand, citing a piece of advice that Lee gave him a while back. He gets shanked with the crowbar and starts bleeding out. Lee wants to save him, but Majima thinks that'd be a waste of time. Loyalty is a big part of that Yakuza code he lives under, and Bleeding Doctor Man just violated that. Not long after this does Majima see his philosophy put into play. Lee doesn't listen, so Goro flees with Makoto. No way these hobos are the last of Sakawa's goons after all. Shortly after catching up with the two, Lee gets cancelled by a car bomb. Sagawa pulls up, gat equipped and ready to clap Majima for betraying him. His dialogue here is actually infuriating. He stays in that oh so smug as shit slave master role even when he thinks that the time for said role is over. As if he doesn't want it to be. I really wish Sarah aimed just a bit higher. The next morning, Goro's tied to a beam in the middle of a warehouse again, having a second go at the consequence for disobeying authority. Sagawa tells a little story about a bird named Mamitaro he rescued and who his parents later fed to a cat. This little anecdote's meant to be an analogy for why Majima shouldn't rescue blind women behind his parents' back. It all falls apart though when Sagawa mentions killing his parents' cat a day later. Majima doesn't know it, but he's soon to be in the pussy slaying phase of his little tit rescue. The bird's still out there, and he and Sagawa have got to find her before she gets ate. Turns out, Sagawa doesn't know a damn thing about Makoto or why she's even a target. Shimano just told them to use Majima to get her and stopped there. He's got Sagawa on strings too. It's like a food chain of manipulation. Their only lead is Nishitani, so Majima starts there and catches word of an old crooked cops named Billiken. Billiken was Nishitani's foster dad, and according to him, Nishitani was picking pockets at 5, breaking into cars by 12, and had killed a guy in high school. The reason? Said guy killed Billiken's daughter. It was a revenge thing. It rubbed off on Billiken, and he turned that anger into an arena in which he six criminals onto each other. I guess rehabilitation comes in the form of bloodshed to this guy. It's also largely funded by bribes Nishitani hands Billiken for all the crime he does. The two reunite in a cell where Goro remarks that had he and Nishitani met on better terms, they might be friends. He's fond of his crazy lifestyle. Nishitani states that they've already met on the best terms imaginable before telling him everything he knows about Sera and the Nikio Consortium, and then asks Majima to work with him under Shibusawa until the game's over. Majima declines, citing his dedication to Makoto. He's the reason she isn't dead yet, and he wants to be the reason she gets to live free as well. Finish what he started. Nishitani and Billiken both get bodied by the cop that had watched over Nishitani's cell. Shibusawa paid him off. Nishitani accepts his death with grace and gives Majima some final words of advice. Words that Billiken gave to him once. <laughs> Oh, 
っさとくたばるんかい Majima will grow to live by these words. On his way out of the jail, he runs into Sagawa, and the same comedy routine takes place. Only this runs interesting, because Sagawa calls him a dog before putting him back on his leash and leading him to Camellia Grove. While there, Majima runs into Sarah, who can't make sense of his motivation, and in fairness, it seems illogical at face value. Why would a hitman on thin ice try to rescue his mark? Truth is, Majima's connection to Makoto runs a bit deeper than basic bitch love or a good Samaritan's hope to help. Makoto's safety and innocence are ultimately what convinced him to finally challenge his masters and act independently, something he's never had the courage to do. He's likely grateful for this and wants to return the favor. Later on, she calls him a keeper and suggests that he's the reason she got this far, but this easily goes both ways. Sarah gets shot, they get the business card and head on to Kamurocho, where Majima ignores a guy getting his ass beat because he's not cute, blind, or the subject of his development. He gets picked up and sent to Shimano by goons, where he learns the truth of his situation. At no point was Majima ever actually exercising any sort of autonomy. He was doing exactly what Shimano wanted him to do. Hide the girl, keep her safe, and be the perfect person to convince her to sell the lot she'd inherited. For the past three years, all Majima's really wanted is to be free, and the revelation that the one pill he finally had the chance to swallow happened to be a placebo breaks him. He wallows his way into giving Nishikiyama exactly what he deserves, and discovers Makoto having nested over the land that put her life at risk. Her brother's soul just got yoinked in front of her healing eyes, and now she wants revenge. What we see next from Majima might seem like regression. He suggests that Makoto sell the land to Shimano and drop all her anger. He simply isn't thinking about himself here, and would gladly be a tool for Shimano just a little while longer if it earns Makoto her freedom. If he's not getting his, he may as well help someone else get theirs. His focus has shifted. That shift holds consistent until Makoto gets suspended from life by Laogui after being really stupid and caving into her anger. This moment enables a huge turn for Majima. After realizing that his freedom is bogus and spending some time under the impression that he really is trapped, he takes Nishitani's advice and blazes a path on his own terms. He intends on killing Sohei Dojima and his lieutenants, something that would do him in whether he succeeds or not. As far as he knows, he'd get a bullet at best and a second round of the hole at worst, not to mention anything or everything in between. But none of it matters. Dying early is part of the deal. It's time to avenge his bird and stomp some cats. On his way to the Dojima family office, he runs into Sagawa and hesitates to play his new role in front of him, almost like a 13-year-old learning to defy his mother. This is the first time the Mad Dog moniker's ever spoken, and Sagawa almost seems to admire the transformation. He's impressed and is unofficially checked out as the devil on Goro's shoulder. We get our first glimpse at the Majima we've come to know today, as he smears his shit all over Dojima HQ. After beating the bricks off Awano, the two have a heart to heart. Awano remarks that had he been less calculated and acted on his instincts, maybe he'd be more than a Dojima shoe shiner. Majima's response is eye-opening, as it's the first and only time he ever vocally acknowledges what's been happening in his mind. He's spent every day since Sajima's arrest completely constricted, and just as he defies orders for the very first time, he's shown exactly what peak freedom looks like. It's violent, it's vulgar, and it has more regard for its present than it does its future. It lives like an idiot, and dies like an idiot, in a blaze of glory. This inspires Awano to finally put his balls first and sacrifice himself for Majima's sake, and Majima returns the favor by putting the fear of God into his killer. Sarah ultimately convinces Majima not to finish his job by mentioning the potential of adding one more to the list of parallels between him and Makoto. Saijima carrying out the Ueno hit by himself left Goro with a debt he can't repay, and getting revenge on Makoto's behalf can do the same to her. The last thing he'd ever want to do at this point is add more to that list, seeing how crooked his life is. 
When Majima returns to Shimano to tell him just how fucked he is, he's confronted with the reality that none of this has stopped him from being under Shimano. The big man's got big plans and intends on putting Majima at the forefront, appointing him as captain of the Shimano family where he'll remain until 2005. 17 whole years. It's during this time that he attained his rep as the Mad Dog of Shimano. Goro Majima's Mad Dog front serves two purposes. It's a means by which Majima can live life to his definition of the fullest, enjoying himself in a way meant to directly contrast with the constriction he's likely felt his whole life. It's also meant to ensure that he's both unpredictable and ungovernable, unable to be spun around anyone's finger and, in theory, incapable of ever being tamed again. The symbol most associated with the Mad Dog persona is the Hanya on Majima's back. The Hanya is intended to portray a drastic shift in character due to emotional distress, specifically women who have become demons due to jealousy or obsession. Depending on how the mask is tilted, it could look either fearsome or severely depressed. It harbors two emotions at all times, but only one is ever visible. Majima and Makoto's last meeting is in a culmination of everything I've said about their dynamic thus far. Majima decks some guys to protect her, and does everything in his power to influence the course of her life while personally steering clear of it. But never before this scene is the dynamic so transparent. The last thing we see from 1988 is Makoto returning to the lot and visiting the closest thing her brother ever got to a grave. After digging into some rubble with her man fingers, she discovers her once broken watch. Majima could be seen holding it earlier and has either replaced the thing or gotten it fixed. Makoto visiting the lot and stumbling upon the watch before anyone else could is quite a poetic, almost romantic thing for Majima to expect, almost as if he thought his swing would miss but tried anyway. Majima misses quite a bit, and it's a shame that this rare hit ultimately doesn't go anywhere. At least, not for a very, very long time. It's immediately after the events of 88 that a bit of a curveball is thrown into the side of Majima's character. During his last year living in Sotenbori, he came in contact with the then semi-popular action film star, Naoki Katsuya. And it was through Katsuya that he met who would quickly become his next love, an orphaned Korean immigrant named Mireille Park. Mireille was an inspiring idol who took solace in the inspiration she'd see on television during a time in which she was abused by her caretakers, a source of escapism that formed into a tangible dream. The two were only acquainted for about a year, and yet by Mireille's official debut as an idol and her 18th birthday, they had already gotten married. I believe that Majima's rapid pursuit of this relationship was an unconscious remedy for the lovesickness left behind by Makoto's fade into his memories. Yakuza Zero's ending would lead you to believe that he jumped from cabaret manager to Mad Dog in an instant, as this was likely his plan at the time. I think he got bogged down by his unreciprocated emotions toward Makoto and fell into the arms of the first woman to give him, the real him, any semblance of adoration. This relationship crashed and burned. You probably already know that idol industries across Asia tend to be very restrictive regarding their talent and their personal lives. Mireille Park hid not only their marriage from her agency, but her Korean ancestry as well. And this all came to a head when she felt forced to abort what was to be her and Majima's child without hesitation. This was a breaking point for him, and Goro was quick to hit Park and stomp his feet all the way to Kamurocho. I believe that this ordeal is tied with Majima's autonomy being of utmost importance to him. This is, of course, ironic, and rushing emotion tends to lead us toward doing stupid, ironic shit. Park's choosing to abort their child solely for the sake of her own career might have been interpreted by the still very scarred Majima as her exuding a significant level of control over his life for her benefit. And it was for nothing, because just about every secret Park had kept from her agency was eventually revealed, and her career was abruptly halted just before her dream performance. She drifted by and struggled to find work in the industry, before starting her own agency with the hope of living vicariously through her recruits. Before I move on from this, I just want to say that the only information we have on this year of Majima's life is from the accounts of both Park and Katsuya throughout Yakuza 5. 
As such, no speculation can ever be acknowledged as entirely accurate, and unless RGG puts out Yakuza 358 Days Over 2 or something, we'll never have a clear picture of what went down. Basically, I can be wrong, and that's okay. Yakuza 0 implies that at some point following the empty lot insanity and perhaps the marriage from hell, Goro Majima and Kazuma Kiryu came into contact for the very first time. A scene in which Majima first shouts his iconic, but their meeting in 1995 would make you believe that they hadn't become very amicable yet. Sometime between 89 and now, the Majima family was formed. Still a subsidiary of Shimano's, but it's had more freedom for old Goro. Now in 95, talk of a Kiryu family's made its way. Goro deems it appropriate to enact capital punishment, but before he can pierce the poor guy's dome, Kiryu grabs his arm. Majima probably expected this, viewing Kiryu as a goody-goody cheerleader. After trying to encourage Kiryu to roughen up, he's met with the response that he impulsively views as a challenge to his own methods. Majima's demand to scrap with Kiryu could be a page out of Nishitani's book. He insists on fighting right here, right now, upping the ante with umbrella bashes and an unsheathing of his signature paper poker. But unlike Nishitani, he quits while he's ahead, instead opting to give Kiryu some precious advice. Majima refers to Kiryu's loyalty to a construct like purpose as pointless deprivation, and calls back to his own past by stating that deprivation will break him. Despite everything Majima says, Kiryu sticks to his guns, putting his own autonomy before anyone else's suggestions, and I believe this respect to be the driving force behind his apparent obsession with Kiryu for the rest of the series. There are, of course, other things, like Majima potentially remembering Kiryu's involvement in the whole lot thing, or the Saijima similarities, or the fact that Kiryu spends the entire series going his own way and sticking it to anyone and everyone. Nevertheless, Majima understands early that this man is worth protecting at any cost. It's the reason he takes both a knife and a bullet in the span of a couple days just for him, or expresses genuine grief upon assuming that he hit him with his pretty truck. This protection largely comes in the form of constant scraps. Majima fights Kiryu every chance he gets, not because he views Kiryu as a rival, but as a pupil. Do you really think he continuously throws himself at Kiryu, expecting to win a single fight? No, he wants the cream pie, and he's disappointed when it's not very sweet after Kiryu leaves prison in 05. He's testing Kiryu's strength against his own to ensure that Kiryu stays on track and remains ungovernable. The Tojo clan mostly consists of shitters like Shimano or incels like Nishiki, pulled from an assembly line year after year. Fellas like Kiryu and Majima are rare in their world, and they both know it, so they stick together. It's not necessarily about the Tojo, Kiryu's not even a member for most of the series. It's about the principle of autonomy and always getting your way, consequences be damned. Kiryu embodies this as Majima does, but just as he says, in his own way. A few short months after the fried koi incident of 2005, Jingon Mafia plant Yukio Terada took his seat as fifth chairman of the Tojo. His approach? Spineless. His court? Jabroni Central. An NPC serves his purpose and Majima's practically framed for it. When he heads to the florist of Sai for answers, he's told that he's trusted to run purgatory, from a guy he's never spoken to. The florist proves that Uematsu was killed by one of Majima's own men, and that he fled to be what can be considered his personal hell at this point, Sotenbori. Sotenbori is to Majima what Kamurocho becomes to Kiryu, a city you can only ever associate with all the terrible things you've seen and lived through there. And no matter how much you may insist on never returning, it's where all your dreams take place. You'll never be free. Majima stops at the Grand Ferentel, talks to his old business rival for more, and is swindled into accepting a massage at Kaiken, where it all started. What follows is one of the most powerful moments in the series' history. Makoto, surnamed now Tateyama, petrifies Majima with her presence. He can't bring himself to look at her. Everything about this scenario, from the location to the watch on Makoto's wrist, is a near-perfect mirror image of the very circumstance that brought them together. And yet, so much has changed. Makoto hurts Majima several times, but he's so desperate to not be recognized that he holds his warranted yelps. Majima normally cares very little about how he's perceived. His persona is intentionally maniacal and brash in order to keep others away and prevent them from manipulating him. 
But with Makoto, he cares almost desperately. He behaves helplessly embarrassed of what he's become, and the last thing he wants is for Makoto to know. Makoto calls her watch a treasure and seems to have done everything possible to maintain it, even to the point of sacrificing its look by replacing its worn strap with an ugly one that doesn't even fit. She liked the old one more though, it was more sophisticated. Majima was sophisticated once, but today that's not so true. At least, he can finally find solace in the fact that he succeeded in paving the road before Makoto like he intended 18 years back. She's married, has a child, and is a week away from flying overseas for her husband's work. Yet this new life has always served as a reminder of everything Majima did to make it possible. And now, Makoto continues to work at Kaiken hoping for the chance to thank him for all of it. Majima loved this girl. He still might, but learning that his efforts weren't wasted works out all the knots he's had for 18 years. As far as we know, Majima doesn't step foot in Sotenbori again until the events of Yakuza 7. This encounter both freed him and gave him the courage to visit the other ghosts of his past. In 2010, Yasuko Saijima returned to Kamurocho at the request of a man she assumed was a Tokyo detective, allegedly in need of a witness on her brother's behalf. In truth, she was called over by Isao Katsuragi, who admitted to being a witness himself, but refused to give any sort of testimony until Yasuko did one of two things. Either cough up 100 million yen, or kill someone. With Taiga's execution quickly approaching, Yasuko had to think fast, and doubting that anyone would give her a loan so massive, she opted to catch a body to save her brothers. But what was meant to be just one murder turned into a citywide killing spree, as Katsuragi wouldn't budge until every single one of Shibata's men who'd been around for the Ueno hit was dead. He wanted absolutely no witnesses. Realizing that no amount of bodies would ever free Saijima, she ran to Sky Finance, Kamurocho's sleaziest money lending business. It's unclear just how much Majima knew, but he was at the very least aware of Yasuko's presence and impending danger. At this point, Majima not only has access to the florist of Sai, but also quite possibly the largest family in Tojo history. And as soon as possible, he sends one of his goons to Akiyama's Club Elise, where he himself arrives shortly after. Majima's intent here is pretty obvious. He hasn't yet learned the truth of what went down that day, and now wants to smother his guilt by protecting Yasuko. When Saijima escapes, Majima stages several of his men at the base of the Millennium Tower before making his grand entrance. Through putting his forces on display, Majima wants Saijima to understand just how much he's accomplished in the past 25 years. When they get to the batting center, Majima is almost reluctant to address the elephant in the room, while Saijima insists on it. When realizing that there isn't any escape, he adopts a let's just get it over with attitude and challenges Saijima to a fight in exchange for the little information he has. There isn't much to say about their following heart to heart that isn't already made obvious by simply watching the scene yourself, other than the fact that it happens and it's honestly the last worthwhile thing Majima ever does on screen. He gets betrayed by Daigo and arrested, only to turn up free at the very end of the game. He spends most of Yakuza 5 in the background, either presumed dead and in hiding, or captured by Kurosawa. I want to preface this explanation by stating that Yakuza 5's narrative is a Nomura tier fucking mess, and that describing it coherently is about as difficult as playing Operation with lubed hands. They really took the piss with this one, and wrote rank B-movie dog shit solely meant to yank cheap and visceral emotions out of you. Now don't get me wrong, I love it, but for all the wrong reasons. And it absolutely succeeds at its exact intention. I feel everything when I play this fucking game. Anyway, supposedly, Majima, Katsuya, and Park conspired to weed out a traitor in Katsuya's midst, who'd later be revealed as Kamon Kanai. And they did this through a fake letter Majima seemed to have written to Park, requesting that they meet. It was bait for Kanai, who was tasked with tracking Majima down by Kurosawa. The quest to get this letter led to Park being murdered by her recently fired employee, Kan Okita. In a way, it's like Nishitani said, make mischief long enough and it'll bite you in the ass. This bizarre specimen, Goro Majima, picked this girl up from off the streets of Osaka when she was 17, likely because he was still thirsting for another woman he just couldn't have, knocked her up, beat her and she got rid of it, and left her practically for dead, only to contact her 23 years later so that she could contribute to a funny little Yakuza scheme that wipes her off the map. 
practically killed her by proxy, and in the end has fuck all to say about it. Ay ay ay, this fucking guy. What a sigma they wrote him into for this stellar installment. Christ. Park is not a very popular character. Common consensus seems to suggest that she's psychotic and unforgivable because she girl boss gaslit Kiryu into being a deadbeat father. But I don't know, if I had to put up with Call Me Goro, I'd lose my shit too. Honestly, I stand. Slay Queen. Get that murder. Why did they massacre my boy like this? Why did they decide to make him so awful out of nowhere? And the worst part is that this Park Bull is his last meaningful contribution to the series. He's absent for almost the entirety of Yakuza 6, and with the Tojo and Omi dissolved as of Yakuza 7, what the hell is he going to do with his life? Work as his security guard? Wow. Guess he's the mad dog of Seiyu now. Exercising that autonomy and guarding the stamina. I wasn't in the fandom at the time, but I assumed that Yakuza 5 put a bit of a bitter taste in the mouths of Majima fans. Can't prove it, but it just makes sense. Yakuza 0 was released in Japan a few months before the West could download 5, and Majima was put center stage due to all the intrigue he'd garnered over the years. Even before its release, he was already winning polls for favorite character. Yakuza 3 was the first game to make him out as more than a madman, and he only got more complex from there, for better or worse. Even with that fitting Hanya tattoo, I don't think Majima was planned. I think he started as a one-note goon much like the rest, and was probably meant to die in Shangri-La. But because everyone happened to love him so much, he was given layer after layer, subtlety after subtlety. You just don't see this sort of thing, it's amazing. Now, if only Kaoru Sayama got the same treatment. 